Ayakema was my very first Dharma teacher. I went on a retreat in 1985, curious about meditation. And Ayakema was the teacher and she was brilliant. One of the things that anybody who sat with her would say that was that she was extremely clear. Her clarity was a really helpful thing. And yeah, that's what struck me to begin with. And yeah, she gave me enough good advice on that retreat, so I kept practicing. Three years later, I was in Thailand and went to Wat Suan Mok, which was Ajahn Buddha Dasa's monastery in southern Thailand for a 10-day retreat. And while I was there, I stumbled into what I now know is the first jhana. They told me I was experiencing PT. All I knew was that I liked it and I was, uh, I was now meditating because I wanted to as opposed to because I knew it was good for me. So that was a nice change. Over the next couple of years, I sat several more retreats and I would tell the teachers, you know, I can get this PT going. What am I supposed to do with it? And I actually don't remember what anybody told me because whatever they told me didn't match my experience and being rather stubborn, I just ignored them and kept bringing up the PT. Then in 1990, one of my friends handed me a flyer and said, you want to do a retreat? This teacher's really good. And it was Ayakema. And I was like, yeah, she is really good. She was my first teacher. I should sign up. So I did. And I go into my first interview with Aya. And after, you know, preliminary stuff, she says, well, tell me about your meditation. And I said, well, I can get to PT. And she goes, oh, good. That's the first jhana. Here's how you do the second. Somebody knew what was going on and knew what was supposed to happen next. And by the end of that retreat, I knew she was my teacher and I continued to sit with her until she passed away in 1997. The jhanas. So the Buddha's teachings could be put into three categories. Sila, Samadhi, Panya. Sila being morality or ethics. Samadhi is usually translated as concentration. Not a bad translation, but I think a little better would be indistractability. Concentration has this furrowed brow thing. Indistractability is what we're after. The ability to put your mind on something and not become distracted. And then panya, which is wisdom. So basically what the Buddha is saying is clean up your act, learn to concentrate your mind, and use your concentrated mind to investigate reality so you can understand what's actually happening. We'll talk about all three of these aspects of the path during this retreat. But right now, a little overview of the jhanas. The jhanas are eight altered states of consciousness that arise through concentration, and each one gives you even more concentration. So by entering the first one, it gives you enough concentration to arrive at the second, which gives you enough to get to the third, etc. And you're stair-stepping your way to deeper and deeper levels of concentration. The purpose of the jhanas is to generate a mind that's concentrated, clear, sharp, bright, malleable, wieldy, and given to imperturbability, which you can direct and incline to knowing and seeing. In other words, the jhanas are a warm-up practice for your insight practice. They will generate a mind that is more likely to gain more and deeper insights when you begin investigating reality. The foundation though is sila, morality, ethics. If you've been out robbing banks and you come to meditate, you're probably gonna be worried about them coming to haul you away. Well, I don't expect any of you have been robbing banks, but 
if your ethics are good, then you have quite a lot less to worry about when you sit down to meditate and you'll be much more likely to get concentrated. And you're going to need some of that concentration to get into the jhanas. So the foundational practice for sila is the five precepts, the five rules of behavior that enable you to lead an ethical life. And they're the rules for this particular retreat. The first of these rules is I undertake the training to refrain from killing living beings. Each of these has three levels. And the first level is don't kill anybody. Now this not only includes people, but it includes animals. There are lots of other creatures around wherever you have to be, whether you're at home or at a retreat center or a cabin in the woods or wherever. And they've got just as much right to be there as you do. So if you encounter some creature, find a piece of paper and a cup and trap it and take it outside. One of the most important things to learn on the spiritual path is the fact that we're all vastly interconnected. You can't kill something unless you hate it. I mean, you have to think my life is more valuable than this creature's life. So this first precept is actually the foundation for metta, loving kindness practice. To act in harmony with the fact that we're all interconnected means to act in harmony by loving every creature, by not harming them, by not killing them. So bottom line, don't kill. A second level would be not harm any living creature. And the highest level would be to love all living creatures. The second of these precepts is I undertake the training to refrain from taking that which is not given. So the bottom line is don't steal. Don't take what's not given. You're probably all familiar with the Four Noble Truths, and the second Noble Truth is that dukkha arises dependent on craving. Well, if you're willing to steal something, that's pretty egregious craving. So just be willing to only take what is given. It's very interesting when I went on that first retreat with Ayakema, she had a very nice ceremony of taking the precepts at the end of the retreat. And although I wasn't particularly interested in the Buddhist stuff, it, it did make sense. So I didn't do the ceremony really, but I did say them when we were supposed to recite them. And after that, you know, when I needed a, a, a new ink pen, I didn't just steal one from work. It was like, yeah, okay, this is this is actually something important here. I should... I should pay attention here. A higher level of this precept would be to have respect for other people's property, whatever it is. Those of you on a retreat, those of you in a cabin or something, yeah, you're using somebody else's stuff and you want to leave it in as good a shape as it is when you arrived. So having respect for other people's property, not just don't take it, but have respect for it. Treat it as though it were your own in terms of taking care of it. And then the highest form of this precept would be actually generosity, letting go. As I came and said, the, the essence of the spiritual path is letting go. There's nothing to get, there's everything to let go of. And so the highest form of this precept is practicing letting go. Now, yeah, while we're on this retreat, there won't be much time for generosity. We're hardly interacting at all. But at the end of the retreat, there'll be opportunities for generosity, of course. The third of the precepts, I undertake the training to refrain from sexual misconduct. Sexual misconduct would be using your sexual energy in any way that causes suffering, dukkha, hurts, anyone else or yourself. This would include things like not cheating on your spouse. I mean, even if your spouse didn't find out, it would still be breaking the precept because 
If they did find out, they would be upset. So don't use your sexual energy in any way that upsets anyone. A higher form of this precept would to interact with everyone in a way that doesn't cause harm. However you're interacting, don't cause harm to whoever you're interacting with and don't cause harm to yourself. And then the highest form of this precept would be that all of your interactions are beneficial, beneficial to you and beneficial to the people with whom you're interacting. The fourth of the precepts is I undertake the training to refrain from wrong speech. Wrong speech is defined as speech that is lying, untrue, speech that is harsh or abusive, speech that is divisive, or speech that is gossip or idle chatter. Now, actually, this should be a fairly easy precept to keep on this retreat because we're practicing noble silence. Hopefully, you're not talking to anyone. I realize many of you are at home, and if you're at home, there's uh, maybe people to talk to. You want to keep the talking, the interacting to an absolute minimum. We call it noble silence, but I would actually prefer to call it noble non-communication. At the time of the Buddha, about the only way to communicate was to talk. Writing was known, but it was only used for accounting purposes. Silence, basically, don't communicate. But now we have so many other ways to communicate. Email, telephones, the internet, all that comes in from that, books newspapers. What you want to do is get your mind as still and quiet as possible. This will make it much easier to investigate what goes on in your mind, which is a really important part of the spiritual path. And it will give you a much better chance of getting deeply concentrated. So noble non-communication. At a retreat center, I like to call, collect people's cell phones. You know, just turn in your cell phone. And I'll put it in a safe place. If you absolutely need it, you can let me know and I'll give it back to you. But uh, yeah, it was much nicer before cell phones became a thing. It was easier for people to keep silence on retreat. And well, that's where we are today. So hopefully you can put your cell phone either off or in airplane mode and just don't work with it. Yeah, I know some people use their cell phone as an alarm clock. That's fine. But don't look at it. Don't look at the internet. You probably have heard something about there's an election going on right now. Don't, don't look at that. I'm not going to tell you what's going on there. If you want to know... When you have your interview, you can ask me. I will keep up with what's going on, but uh, I'm not going to mention it. So yeah, noble silence. A higher form of this precept would be that when you have something to say or communicate with anyone, that it be beneficial. You say stuff that's actually useful. At the time of the Buddha, it was quite appropriate if someone asked you a question to just not answer. I kind of wish that was still the case. I think it would be a lot less frivolous chatter going on, but it's going to be easy on the retreat, you know, because you're in noble silence. The highest form of this precept would be to communicate about the Dharma. The Buddha said to the monks and nuns that if you want to discuss the Dharma, that's fine. Otherwise, Keep noble silence. The fifth of the precepts is I undertake the training to refrain from intoxicants, drugs and alcohol, recreational drugs and alcohol. If you're taking medicine, by all means, take your medicine. 
uh, as I came and said on that first retreat, we are confused enough already. You don't need to ingest anything that will make you more confused. That was, that was really, I thought, quite profound. If you really want to know the truth, you're going to need a clear mind to find out what's going on. Don't indulge in things that give you a confused mind. A higher form of this precept would be to be careful of everything that you ingest. The books, the TV stations, uh, the internet, the trashy novels, the uh, yeah, food. If they have a 12-step program for it, yeah, you, if people are using it in an addictive manner. We have so many ways we can escape now. You don't have to go get drunk to escape. I mean, I, I love cat videos on YouTube as much as anybody, but how many cat videos do you want to watch? I don't think there are going to be a lot of people on their deathbed going, oh, I don't think I ever watched enough cat videos. So yeah, I understand sometimes you come home from work and you just need to do something mindless. All right, so you do it to de-stress, but don't get lost. Uh, we won't even mention Facebook or Twitter and getting lost in those things. And then the highest form of this precept would be to make sure that everything you ingest is beneficial. Food, books, everything. So these are the five precepts, five rules for behavior for a lay person, the five rules for students on this retreat. Are there any questions or comments? Is the, are the three um, steps of each precept, is that in a sutta somewhere? Nope. That's... Uh, is something that I sort of formalized based on what Ayakema said. You do find multiple steps, such as uh, I undertake the training to refrain from killing living beings. One should promote the welfare of all living beings. So you do find statements like that, but the three levels themselves, uh, there's no formal place where they all show up. And then usually it's just the precept and the opposite, such as be for the welfare of all beings as opposed to kill them. I've always had difficulty with the idea of not gossiping. I know I use gossip with strangers to establish a level of friendliness and then with my girlfriend's some degree of connection and expressing care with, about their life without necessarily getting into details. And I'm just curious what you think about that. Yeah, sometimes what we discuss with people that we just meet or our coworkers or somebody is what the Buddha referred to as unedifying conversations. They're not edifying. For the monks and nuns, it was like, yeah, don't indulge in edifying, unedifying conversations. Talk about the Dharma. But we're, you know, we're not monastics. I can tell by looking at everybody. You know, everybody's got too much hair to be a monastic. So, all right. So at times we're meeting people and in order to connect, we're going to be connecting at a level that is, yeah, it, it doesn't need to be gossip so much, but it, it's, it's not particularly edifying. And I think that's okay. The key thing is to know that the topic that you're discussing is not a particularly edifying topic. And if you see an opening to take it into something that's a better, more edifying topic, by all means, take that opportunity. But yeah, I had friends who work at my last computer job that you know, were totally into sports. And it was just a lot easier to you know, wander into their cubicle and say, hey, how about the sharks last night? Than to say, would you like to hear some Dharma? I mean, 
they weren't interested. But it was still nice to be able to communicate with them on, on a level that we could communicate with. And then if we got a chance to take it to a higher level, do that. Okay, so that's the sila part. Next is the samadhi part. And the jhanas are, well, they're sama, samadhi, often translated as right concentration or appropriate indistractability. And so we'll be talking about the jhanas on this retreat, but I have to give you two warnings. On any retreat where you're working with concentration, it's quite possible that unresolved psychological stuff may show up. Normally we go around, we got everything under control, but you start getting really focused and you're not keeping that stuff at bay. All of your energy is going into the focus and unresolved stuff shows up. That's just what happens. Hopefully none of you have any unresolved psychological issues, but in just on the off chance that anybody does have some, this is might be what happens. If it does happen, well, okay, you'll have an interview. And I guess that's what we talk about because my question basically is what's happening when you meditate. So if your stuff is coming up, we can talk about it. You'll all have three interviews during this retreat. They'll be either two or three days apart. There are eight full days and three into eight doesn't go evenly. So, you know, probably have one day off between two, a pair of interviews and two days off between another pair of interviews or something like that. Okay. So yeah, if your stuff comes up, let me know. We can talk about it. If it comes up and it's really bad, send me an email. It, you know, you don't have to wait to your interview if you think it'd probably be good to talk before your next scheduled interview. I'm your backup. I'm here for you. So if stuff's coming up, my job is to be there. So, but I, you have to let me know. One of the disadvantages of a Zoom retreat, you can't, if it comes up in the middle of the night, you can't come knock on my door. It's a little far away. So, but you can send me an email. The second warning is if you have any expectation of experiencing the jhanas on this retreat, you're in trouble. Expectations are the worst thing to bring on any retreat. All that you can really expect from any retreat as that things will be different than you expect them to be. That's it. The problem with expectations on a jhana retreat though, is that you're wanting something and wanting that's the first hindrance and it's going to get in the way of experiencing the jhana. You have to want to do the work well enough and deeply enough so that you can enter the jhanas but you can't want to enter the jhanas. I realize this is crazy. The best thing I can tell you is I'll lay out the instructions as clearly and precisely as I can. And your job is to follow the instructions without thinking about the destination. It's like if, well, I'm in Oakland, California. And if you were here and I was to tell you how to get to New York City. And I'd say, okay, yeah, what you do is you, you, you get on 580 and you go and wait till it merges with 101 and, and, and 280. And, you know, you, you just go up that way and, right, and you, you, you know, and I start giving you all the instructions and so forth. If you're just driving out of my driveway and start looking for New York City, uh, you're going to have an accident before you get out of Oakland. So the, the idea is when you're given instructions is to know where you are, what you're supposed to do given where you are, and what landmark to look for for when you switch to doing something else. So get on 580, take it till it merges with 80. 
you're on 580, you're just waiting until you can merge with 80. And now you take 80. And yeah, okay. So it, it's a matter of figuring out where you are in relationship to the full set of instructions without looking at the destination. If I give you the instructions for getting to New York City and you follow them and the instructions are correct, then you don't even know, to, need to know what New York City looks like. You'll just eventually wind up there. It's the same with the jhanas. I'll lay out the instructions tomorrow morning for getting to the first jhana. And your job is to, well, know what the instructions are and know where you are in relation to the whole list of instructions and what you're looking for so that you start doing something else. Okay. And in fact, I can tell you the first little bit of these instructions right now. In order to enter the jhanas, it's necessary to generate a sort of baseline level of concentration. This goes by the name access concentration. The phrase access concentration doesn't appear in the suttas. It shows up in the commentaries, although it might be in the Abhidhamma, I'm not sure, but it's definitely in the commentaries. But it's a useful phrase, even though my definition of what is access concentration doesn't correspond exactly to what's found in the commentaries. And we'll get into the commentaries and what they have to say about the jhanas much later in this retreat. But I would define access concentration as being fully with your object of meditation. And if there are any thoughts, they're wispy and in the background and not pulling you into distraction. And there are, well, a number of ways to generate access concentration. The commentaries describe in detail 30 different ways, all of which are found in the suttas. But we're obviously not going to talk about 30 different ways to meditate in the 10-day course. I'm going to talk about three principally. Mindfulness of breathing, metta, or loving-kindness meditation, and body scan, or sweeping meditation. I'm going to talk principally about mindfulness of breathing tonight, and I'll bring in the others as we go along. So in order to do mindfulness of breathing, what you need to do is sit down, get yourself settled into whatever your posture is so that you're reasonably comfortable. It says in the suttas, one sits down cross-legged, holds one's body erect and sets up mindfulness before oneself. Well, the cross-legged posture is wonderful if you can sit comfortably in the cross-legged posture. Unfortunately, we have these things called chairs that probably messed up your ability to sit comfortably cross-legged. So sit in a way that's upright and relatively comfortable. That's the best thing to do. You can kneel on a bench, sit in a chair, just find something that works for you. You don't want to be too comfortable because then you fall asleep. And you want to be upright because that helps keep you awake. And then one sets up mindfulness before oneself. Literally, it says that one becomes mindful of the mukta, which literally means mouth. But I think it doesn't mean your pie hole. It means the opening of the nostrils. Basically, the idea is you put your attention on the tactile sensations associated with breathing at the nostrils, a little inside the nostrils, or the area between the nostrils and your upper lip, wherever you feel the touch of the breathing. Now, for those of you who are used to paying attention to the breath at the abdomen, the rise and fall there, or the rise and fall at the chest, that will also work. If you can choose amongst those, choose the nostrils. The reason being that it's more difficult, it's more subtle. You have to pay more attention. You have to generate more concentration to do it successfully. And since we're trying to generate concentration, that's why it's a bit better to work at the nostrils. But for some people, the nostrils just don't work. It's too weird. They've been used to doing something else. 
your sinuses are stopped up with an allergy, you've got a deviated septum. There are all sorts of possibilities why the nostrils might not work, in which case just use what you're used to. But if you can use the nostrils, it works quite well. So sit down, get yourself settled, put your attention on the tactile sensations associated with breathing. Now, if your mind should wander off, no wait, when your mind wanders off, because that's inevitable, it's not a big deal. This is, this is what human minds do. We're the progeny of creatures that were continuously checking out the environment. Those who fixated on the berries and didn't see the saber-toothed tiger, they got eaten. They didn't reproduce. It was the ones who were checking everything out. We're left with minds that want to check everything out, not become fixated on one thing. So we're actually trying to go against evolution by generating one-pointed concentration. It's okay. We can do that. It's just that we're probably going to get distracted. So when you become distracted, as I say, it's not a big deal. The fact that you noticed you've become distracting, that's a victory. So label the distraction. A label would be one word long, maybe two, never more than three. And the first label that comes to mind is always correct. Spend zero energy trying to get the perfect label. You'll get the perfect label 95% of the time. So just whatever comes to mind, planning, wanting, angry, upset, fantasy, whatever it is, just slap a label on it. And then, very important, relax and bring your attention back to your breathing. So your attention is on the breath. You realize you've become distracted. Label the distraction, relax, and come back. The labeling has two functions. One, it helps you disidentify with the thought stream. By putting a label on it, you, you put some separation there. So it makes it easier to drop that whatever it was that was so enticing, that fantasy or plan or argument or whatever. And it also gives you a sense over time of where your mind habitually goes. Do you more frequently get distracted by the past or the future? Think about it. That's actually kind of weird since all there is is the present. And we're off in the past or the future. Notice how infrequently you get distracted into the present. We're weird creatures. Okay, so, but there could be other insights. Are you a planner? Are you a worry? So put the label on it. It'll give you some insight as well as help you disidentify. And then back to the tactile sensations of breathing. I won't say it's impossible to force your mind to stay with the breath. It, it is possible, but it's not useful. Your attitude while doing meditation of any sort should be one of relaxed, diligence. So part of why you relax when you come back is so you can get the relaxed part going. If you got distracted, it probably generated just a little bit of tension. So just think to yourself, relax and come on back. The strategy is to just keep coming back from your distractions until your mind settles. It may take several days for it to settle. Sorry, that's just the way it goes. You sit down, you put your attention on your breathing and off you go and your label relax, come back and off you go and you just keep doing it. And that may be your whole sit. It never really settles and it may be the next sit. But eventually, it may take three, four, five days actually, your mind settles and it's not going anywhere. And you're knowing each in-breath and you're knowing each out-breath. And if there are thoughts, they're wispy and in the background and not pulling you into distraction. That's access concentration. That's what you're working towards. That's what you're aiming at. That's what's necessary before you're going to be able to enter the jhanas, is generate that sort of concentration. 
Now, especially at the start of a retreat, working with breathing, you may find that you're really distracted. You're thinking about all sorts of things. You're arguing with your boss. You're, you're planning your trip to Hawaii when COVID's over. You're, you know, a million things. Rearranging the contents of your refrigerator. You know, the mustard should really go in the door instead of back behind the mayonnaise. Whatever. Yeah, this is just what we do. So there are some techniques, aids that you can use, particularly at the start of a retreat, if you find yourself just, yeah, really distracted. The first one is counting. Traditionally, you count one on the in-breath, one on the out-breath, two on the in-breath, two on the out-breath. If you get to 10, start again at one. A better way though is breathe in, breathe out, and count in the gap between the out and the in. So breathe in, breathe out, one. Breathe in, breathe out, two. And if you get to eight, start again at one. If you get distracted, start again at one. There are no prizes for getting to eight. It's just put the number in the gap between the out and the in. This seems to work better because we generally tend to get lost on the out breath. You know, the air is going out and so is our mind and off we go. It's fairly easy to stay with the in breath, but then on the out breath, we're getting lost. So aiming to get that number between the end of the out and the beginning of the end really means you got to pay attention. I found this method to be quite helpful. And I noticed it was starting to, I was starting to lose it when I started counting the end of the out breath rather than the gap. Remember when you played miniature golf and there was the windmill and the idea is to hit the ball between the blades of the windmill? Yeah, you want to throw the number between the blades of the in breath and the next out breath. So this is the first one, counting. The second one is if you're a visual person, it may be helpful to visualize an ocean wave coming in on the in-breath and then going out on the out-breath. And another wave coming in on the next in-breath and going out on the out-breath. The third possibility is a word or a pair of words. So you could say a one-syllable word on the in-breath and another on the out-breath or use a two syllable word, first syllable on the in breath, second syllable on the out breath. So you could breathe in peace, breathe out love. So peace, love, peace, love. You could do in, out. Traditionally, you use bu do, bu do, bu do. But any two syllables will work, two one-syllable words or a one two-syllable word. And yeah, do it silently. A fourth possibility is the parts of the breath. Can you notice, not note, not label, but notice beginning of the in-breath, middle of the in-breath, end of the in-breath, gap beginning of the out-breath, middle of the out-breath, end of the out-breath, gap. So beginning, middle, end, gap, beginning, middle, end, gap for each cycle. Don't try and label them. It goes far too fast. You're just trying to notice for each one of those half cycles, those four parts. And if you can do that, it will get you quite concentrated. And then the fifth of the aids is the lengths of the breath. Is this in-breath a longer or shorter than average in-breath? Is this out-breath a longer or shorter than average out-breath? Is every long breath followed by a long, a long out-breath? Or can you have a long breath in and a short breath out? Or yeah, you get the picture. All right, so this is the five eights, counting, between the out and the in, 
put the number in the gap. Uh, ocean wave visualized coming in and going out. A word or pair of words. The parts of the breath. And the lengths of the breath. If you use one of these aids, pick one. And I'd say use it until your mind feels settled and then use it slightly longer and then let it go. When you let it go, it will feel like you have regressed. In other words, you've gotten to a point where you weren't getting distracted. You let go of the counting and now you're starting to get distracted again. That's, that's usual what happens. Just go without the aid. You will settle in again. Don't switch back to the aid. Now, if you don't settle in again and it just keeps going, it, it, getting distracted, then obviously you didn't stick with the aid long enough. Try it again the next sit. If you try an aid and you don't think it's working, you can't switch to a new aid until the next sit. It's probably not the aid itself. Just play with it and see. Some of them, it takes a little while to catch on to it. If you're sitting for 45 minutes, say, you probably wouldn't use the aid for more than about 15 or 20 minutes. And then you just drop it no matter what's going on. Don't look at a clock, just estimate, right? Looking at a clock is going to mess up your concentration and we're after concentration here. So don't do that. And you don't have to use an aid, but if you, use, if you decide to use one, just use that one for this sit. And then the next sit, if you want to use a different one, that's fine. Any questions about anything we've talked about? It just seems like when I look around my house, there's dishes or laundry and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you were on a retreat, you'd have a yogi job. Yeah, you'd be washing dishes or sweeping or something. Yes. So I would suggest for everybody that you, you make a schedule. This is what Tom said, you know, all right, this is what I'm going to meditate. And this is what I'm going to eat and put a yogi job in for yourself. All right. This half hour, I can get the dog hair, whatever, take the dog for a walk, wash the dishes, whatever. And then don't do any of that other stuff at any other time. Stuff you think you might need to do, schedule it in. If there's another person there, it definitely makes it more difficult. Uh, you want to interact with the other person as little as possible, but unless they're also a meditator, they may not get exactly what's going on. And yeah, you do have to interact. You just want to minimize it as much as you possibly can. And yeah, doing a retreat at home is much more difficult than doing it at a retreat center or doing it at a cabin in the woods or anything like that. Unfortunately, that's what we're stuck with. I think about what would it be like if I were doing a retreat at home and it's frightening because yeah, there's <laughs> all these distractions around. It's, it's a hard thing. And so making a schedule and build into the schedule, your yogi job of whatever stuff you think you're going to have to do. I mean, it may be different stuff every day. Maybe one day in your yoga job, you're running the vacuum cleaner and another one you're, you know, washing the dishes or something like that. But there's, there's a time for your yogi job and you do your yogi job. Okay. Could you remind me what uh, Budo means? It would be Buddha, only it would be declined as possessive, I think. So I came and said it meant to the Buddha. But I'm not certain that's correct. I'm not sure exactly. I mean, I didn't, my Pali is very, very, very basic. But it's it's basically Buddha. So Buddha, only you would say Buddha instead. Can you please repeat, you say that um, after what time you would recommend um, giving up the aid, even if you if it didn't help you? to get the, con the excess concentration. I missed that. Yeah, about 15 to 20 minutes at, from the time you start. Sometimes I find I sit down and I think, okay, I got it. And you know, I spend five minutes just being distracted and it's like, no, it's not gonna work. So I start at that point with the counting. 
And so I'll count for 15, 20 minutes from there rather than from the when I sat down and then drop it. It also can depend on how long you're sitting for. If you're going to be sitting for an hour and a half, then maybe it's 20, 25 minutes if you're still feeling really distracted. But yeah, in general, 15 or 20 minutes is probably sufficient. Thank you. And then if you're still distracted, you just kind of sit with what it is? Yeah, just keep working with it without the aid. It seems like we have a lot of garbage that we have to take out. And we take mm -hmm. out the garbage by getting distracted and thinking about that argument or that plan or whatever. And it's not that I'm encouraging that, but it's just something we seem to have to go through. On a residential retreat, it's three or four or five days before people start learning any jhanas. I mean, it's just every retreat. Uh, some people already know them starting off, okay. But for most people trying to learn them, yeah, you've got to go through this three, four, five days of just being distracted. So work with the aid and then, yeah, let it go. And you just keep doing that. And after three or four or five days, hopefully things will have settled down. So yeah, you let go of the aid and you're still not just getting distracted. Okay, thank yeah. you. Sure, the, the key is relaxed diligence. Yeah, that's the most difficult one. Yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> if this was easy stuff, we'd all gotten enlightened a long time ago. Okay, if there's no questions, we're going to take a five minute break. And then I'm going to do a guided meta. So you can stretch, run to the toilet, whatever. In order to begin, please put your attention on your breath for a few moments. Think of someone that you really care about, someone who's easy to love. Doesn't matter who it is, your significant other, a child, a dear friend, someone you admire, your cat. Get a sense of this being and then get a sense of what it feels like to love. Now take this feeling of love and give it to yourself. You deserve love just as much as anyone else. Think of the person that's easy to love. Get a feel for that love. And now think of other people that you're close to. Bring these people to mind one by one and give them the same feeling of love as you have for the one who's easy to love.
Think of your acquaintances, people like your neighbors, your coworkers, people that you see in places like shops and restaurants you frequent. Again, bring them to mind one by one and give them the same feeling of love as you have for the one who's easy to love. Think of someone you find difficult and give that person as much love as you can. Difficult people probably need a lot of love. Share your love with everyone on this retreat. and with all the people around you, wherever you happen to be, in your neighborhood, near the place where you're staying. Let your love grow stronger so it spreads out reaching to more and more people, filling the whole town. Just keep opening your heart so your love spreads out to everyone in that region. And then to everyone on the continent. Open your heart so wide that your love reaches out to all living beings on this planet. Humans, animals, birds, fish, insects, reptiles, amphibians, forest and fields. Now put your attention back on yourself, back in your own heart, which just generated a whole world full of love. That much love is always available.
May all beings everywhere be happy.